When someone goes missing, their families and friends are left not only with the harrowing grief, but countless questions and a lifetime of what ifs. Nick and Jenny Wright's son, Paul, went missing in October 2003, one month after his 27th birthday. There's not a single hour of any day that passes without them thinking of him, of what they wish they'd done differently, of what they will say if they ever see him again. Now, Nick is sharing their story to try and help people understand just how difficult having a missing loved one is. Every day, not a day goes by, you think about it. You get up in the morning, you think, is today the day? Will something happen? Will we find something? Will any information come to me? And in, in a lot of cases, it's not so much the media or the news, but like you might find that a body is found. And you go, is it today? From a day-to-day basis, you go, we go on holidays. And um, you find yourself scouring people, looking at people. Is that him? Is that him? And somebody is familiar. Somebody walks similar to him. And you find yourself almost tracking them or stalking them. But up to now, no go. It hasn't been him. So... We, we wait, it's pretty empty, we hope. There's a hole in my heart the size of an island There's a hole in my heart the size of an island Islands can be big In 1976, Melbourne couple Nick and Jenny Wright were expecting their first child. They had fallen in love at a young age and were looking forward to starting a family. As Nick was only 19 and Jenny was one year younger, they were slightly nervous about becoming parents, but were mostly excited for what the future held. On Thursday, September 9, 1976, they welcomed their baby into the world a son they named Paul Robert Wright. A couple of years later, when Paul was still a toddler, the family relocated to Sydney. Nick was employed in the Navy and had been drafted to a ship stationed in the New South Wales capital. The opportunity to move into state felt like a real adventure. They settled into their new home, with both parents working to provide for the family. Nick would often drop Paul off at daycare on his motorbike and the unique mode of transportation became a point of pride for the young boy. He had his own motorcycle jacket and helmet and developed a fascination with motorbikes that continued well into adulthood. After roughly two years, Nick left the Navy and the three of them returned to Melbourne to be closer to their extended family. They rented a unit in the southeastern suburb of Clayton with Nick and Jenny often juggling multiple jobs to make ends meet. They struggled with their lack of work-life balance, and Nick says they found themselves wondering if they were doing the right thing. Early days in Sydney were an adventure. They were good. I was in the Navy, I was on a drafted to a ship, and yes, Paul was probably the only kid who went to daycare on a 750 motorbike. We worked, we worked a lot, and we were really determined to get a home of our own. And I look now, obviously I look a lot now, could I have done it differently? Should I have? I don't know. I really don't know. I um, find myself beating myself up. Could you have done it better? How could you have done it better? Did I fail him? Paul was a happy child. He adored animals and doted on the family's pets. When he was 11, his parents gifted him his very own motorbike, a small Pee Wee 50. When visiting his grandparents' farm or on a family camping trip, he would always explore his surroundings on the bike, loving every minute. He was fearless, but not reckless, and always made sure he was wearing the proper safety gear before heading off on an adventure. 
School, however, was harder for Paul. He found its structure restrictive, struggled to engage with tasks such as reading, and didn't always listen to his teachers. Consequently, he often got into trouble for acting up in class. When teachers told Nick and Jenny about their son's behavioural issues, Nick says he took their word for it and felt the need to discipline Paul rather than chat with him about why school was hard. He now looks back on this approach with regret. At the age of 14, Paul transferred to a community school that suited him better than the standard curriculum offered in the 1980s. His new school had counsellors, a learning environment that focused on practical skill sets, and flexible teachers who could cater to his needs. In 1992, when Paul was in his mid-teens, Nick and Jenny had a second son who they named Hayden. Despite the big age difference between the brothers, they had an instant connection. Paul always looked out for his baby brother and would often pick him up from school and take him out for ice cream and other treats. By the time Paul was 16, he was eager to get a part-time job and found one at a supermarket. As he didn't have a driver's license, he rode his bicycle to work each day, but he never complained about this or his workload. Paul enjoyed his job and having his own money. Paul also felt a greater sense of acceptance in the workforce than he did from his school teachers. He proved himself to be a responsible employee with a strong work ethic never taking a sick day if he could help it. After Paul had been employed for a while, he was offered a full-time job. He decided to take it and focus entirely on working, rather than school. Around the same time, Paul also developed a passion for fitness and going to the gym. He dedicated himself to his new interest, becoming incredibly fit and very strong. His endurance, ability, determination and self-discipline were remarkable and he spent most nights working out for hours at a time. As Paul entered his 20s, he kept a steady job but started getting into a bit of trouble, including some minor encounters with the police that didn't result in any charges. His life drifted from his parents and brothers but their bond stayed strong. Regardless of what was happening in his life, His family always reached out to him, and Paul made sure to call them on special occasions. Paul was always um, keen to keep contact. His life changed as he grew older. He would always contact us. He would always be there. Little things like any time he was away on holidays or maybe it was a birthday or any occasion, New Year's Eve and Christmas were especially important, he would ring us. It's going to be a good year. He maintained his close relationship with Hayden too, looking out for his younger brother while also teasing him from time to time. On one occasion, he asked Hayden to wash his car, saying he could choose between a 50-cent piece and a $2 coin as payment. Paul emphasised that the 50-cent coin was much bigger, suggesting it was worth more due to the size. Hayden chose the 50 cents, much to the amusement of Paul who then gave his brother both coins, despite Hayden never even washing the car. Paul was sometimes distant, but had a soft side. He was kind-hearted and would go out of his way to assist the elderly, offering to help them get into their car or carry their shopping. Yet he could react harshly to those that crossed him and was known to occasionally respond violently if he felt wronged. Paul was, um, and is, I hope, a kind man. He was a good soul, a good man. He did a lot of things. We all do a lot of things. We do, we do stuff as young people. I think young people have got the predisposition to do stuff that's basically wrong. I think it's almost their job. They almost have to push the boundaries. They have to be that that they normally wouldn't be. Like everyone, we, we make mistakes. He made some mistakes. He, he sort of wound up with some dodgy mates. And I say they were dodgy mates. I didn't know them particularly well. But he was a good guy, a really good guy, who did a few things that were wrong. In October 2003, a month after Paul's 27th birthday, Nick, Jenny and Hayden were on holiday in Tasmania when they received an unexpected call. We got a call from his girlfriend at the time. 
who said, like, I suppose she was seemed quite distressed and said she couldn't contact him. Now, Paul wasn't always available to be contacted, and that was basically because when we contacted him, we were just mum and dad and he'd get back to you, but he always got back to us. So when he hadn't made contact with her for a long period of time, it was strange. It was, it was more than just circumstance. And I, I suppose in that sense, I thought I'll go back to make sure everything's okay. At the time, Paul was renting a house on Rosanna Road in the northeastern suburb of Rosanna, more than 11 kilometres away from his parents' home in Camberwell. It wasn't unusual for him to go a little while without speaking to his girlfriend, but it had been several days since she'd been able to reach him, so she was growing concerned. Jenny and Hayden stayed in Tasmania while Nick flew back to Melbourne and made his way to Paul's house. Although it was locked up and his car was gone, Nick immediately became concerned when he found Paul's beloved pet rottweiler, Georgia, there all by herself. I think one of the surprises we found, he always had animals. He was magnetic to them. But the fact that it was, re- it was there was really concerning. Nevertheless, Nick didn't report Paul as missing right away, due in part to the nature of his lifestyle. He decided to wait a few days until Jenny returned home from Tasmania so the two of them could discuss what to do together. As I say, he was a grown man and we were trying as parents to allow him to be a grown man. But by the same token, we didn't want to, I suppose, embarrass him or, you know, sort of run and sort of report him missing. His house was locked up. It was during the day, so it was actually quite easy to see that the place had not been... There was no sign of forced entry. There was no sign of drama. And of course, as you go into a place like that, you you are fearing the worst. You are fearing the worst that something bad might have happened. I think I probably watched far too much television. But I got into the house reasonably easily and um, there didn't seem to be any issues with the thing. Unfortunately, when I did go there, um, it was to my dismay that he... He'd done a bit of part-time cultivation work in the house he was in. He was sort of like um, part-time or amateur horticulturalist of, of the hemp variety. We thought, well, we better not do too much too quickly. Basically, we were hoping to find out from him before maybe going to the police. Paul had also recently been involved in a criminal investigation. Police alleged that in March of 2002, 18 months prior to his disappearance, Paul participated in an aggravated burglary in Emerald, an outer suburb located 44 kilometres southeast of Melbourne's CBD. Paul was scheduled to appear in court for this matter, but missed his hearing after he went missing. Consequently, there is now a warrant for his arrest. With that in mind, with that as a background thing and the fact that he had missed his hearing, we had to had to contact the police. It, Everything that was happening was not right. His car, his car was missing. His dog was left. We didn't have any contact point. We didn't know enough about his friends or his contacts to find out what's going on. So, but we had to contact the police. We were pretty distressed, obviously, a little bit guarded too, to some degree, I guess. But we found the process of missing persons to be a low priority or low low intensity, the people, the people who we were reporting it to, maybe we were looking for somebody who was keen and enthusiastic and there was, there was still the feeling that they, they, they were questioning you rather than sort of saying, you as the parent are reporting this young person missing. You're the one who's going through the grief. You're not actually, you're not the criminal. And yes, Paul could have faced charges, maybe he faced charges. But at the time when we were actually reporting him, he was missing. He was our son. Will always be our son. Always be our son. The initial police investigation confirmed that Paul was last seen at his home on Tuesday, September 30, 2003. All of his personal identification was found inside his house and a check of his bank accounts revealed no activity. Police issued a lookout for his vehicle, a 1991 blue Nissan Pintara, with the registration number EMI944, but it was never found. The investigation stalled from there, 
and almost a decade went by with no developments in the case and no sightings or contact from Paul. Nick and Jenny say they didn't receive much information or assistance from the police during this period. On one occasion, they were separately interviewed by two officers who asked about Paul's life and suggested that they might be hiding him. Jenny and Nick have no idea of what sort of investigation was conducted or whether any leads or theories emerged in that first decade. It was probably about six months after Paul went missing. Policemen came and sort of like, I suppose, took further detail. So from the time of when Paul went missing, there was a period lapse of six months and they took three separate samples of DNA from Jenny and they also requested that we uh, access a dental chart. I mean, obviously that's really, really disturbing. The DNA that they took, we, we were quite bemused in the fact that they were taking three samples. And he was quite open to the fact, oh, no, no, we have three separate computer systems set up for this. So there's separate computer systems for Victoria Police, I think New South Wales and Federal. We're lay people. But that seems ridiculous. It just seems bizarre. To be fair, maybe it's a low priority work. But we sort of found that that was sort of the attitude at the time while we're going through the thing. Look, they, a number of years ago, they opened up a, a cold case section and they looked into cases like ours. So they contacted us. We were contacted by two police and they, they sort of, I suppose, questioned us about Paul's whereabouts. Well, obviously, after a period of time like that, we don't have more information. Part of the reason we've uh, reported him missing is because he's lost. It's not because we're trying to hoodwink anyone. I found they were similarly doing a checklist. It was almost like the cold case investigation was window dressing. In order, well, we've ticked the box, that's all done. In 2012, police reopened the investigation into Paul's disappearance and held a press conference appealing for information. Nick and Jenny hoped that something would develop or that Paul would make one of his long-missed New Year's Eve phone calls home. Their phone didn't ring, but the press coverage did lead to a possible sighting of Paul. A woman reported that she'd seen him hitchhiking in Queensland. However, this sighting later turned out to be incorrect. Towards the end of 2019, an individual from Nambour, a town on Queensland's Sunshine Coast, contacted Nick and Jenny to say that a person fitting Paul's description had been shopping at her supermarket. She had made small talk with the man who said that he'd lived in Melbourne 17 years ago. Nick and Jenny made the interstate journey to Nambour to pursue the lead and staked out the location where the man believed to be Paul had been seen. They finally caught sight of him after four long days. We're ambivalent, we didn't know We'd actually been hurt before by somebody making a false statement, which seemed a bit, a little bit guarded. We were a bit guarded, but we thought we're going to do it. We're going to go to the Nambour and we're going to see if this is the case. So we thought, well, we've got details about the vehicle he drove, approximate time he he went shopping, the approximate what he looked like, approximates. So we thought, well, this is it. We're probably the worst private detectives in the world. If there's ever a more obvious stakeout, it was Jenny and I. I think we looked as though we were stalking him. He would have noticed us, but he wasn't there for the previous three or four days we were there. We decided to go a bit earlier. And as it turned out, we're driving along and we saw the vehicle. And Jenny had got out of the car previously because she was, you know, we were sick of it and she was going for a walk. So we we thought, this is it, This this is the guy. We were... I guess euphoric, I guess in some ways. He's obviously gone into the supermarket. So we thought, well, secret agent Nick and Jen will will follow him and try and find him. Uh Aha, we walked. And this poor chap comes out to his car. And of course he's got his shopping and stuff like this. And we're within probably two meters of him, absolutely trying to see any any form of, um, I suppose, recognition or whether in fact it was. Now, sadly, I suppose you could see there was a likeness, but it certainly wasn't him. And he showed no, it wasn't as if we were just looking at, a per, at looking at Paul and Paul was 
actively not showing recognition because he recognised us. It most definitely was not this this man. I feel sorry for the man because these two people are staring at him and um, stalking him back to his car. It was definitely not him. So in that stage, we were driving back to the hotel where we were staying and it was silence. We'd lost the ability to speak and... Um, I was driving and I remember saying to Jenny, I think I know what it is to have a heart attack. Well, actually, she thought I was possibly having a heart attack, but I knew what heartache was. I felt it. It hurt. And I understood what loss was. So we drove quietly, silently. I've never felt pain like that. I've never felt pain like that. The woman who reported it was genuine. That's what Missing Persons is about, where, where people honestly, genuinely see someone, and, but they, when it's not them, it's tough, it's tough. Sadly, it wasn't him, but I, I'm ever so grateful for her for um, telling us. Over the years, a number of supposed sightings of Paul have been reported, but none have ever been confirmed. For Nick and Jenny, not knowing what happened to their son or where he could be is agonising. Part of the reason they decided to participate in this podcast is to try and help people understand just how hard it is to have a loved one go missing. Over the period of time, I'd say I could not count the number of... um, either radio or television, things that are indicating that a body has been found, you always stop. You always, you always feel dread. It is a trauma, but you've all, you've looked at the fact that a body's been found somewhere. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere in Australia, to be honest. And you almost dread, and yet you desire that phone call that Mr. and Mrs. Wright, your son's been found. Now, It holds you in a limbo. It holds you captive. It's hard because they're missing. They're not dead. They're missing. They're not with you. They're missing and you can't find them. It never changes. It never changes. Nick will join me in the studio after this word from our sponsors. And now Nick joins me in the studio for a conversation about his son's disappearance. Firstly, Nick and Jenny, I am so sorry that Paul is still missing. But the way that you have portrayed him is so beautiful. He sounds like such a loving son and brother and I just can't imagine your heartache and I'm so sorry that you are in the unenviable position of still not knowing and on top of that possibly feeling that there is that aspect of judgment based on Paul's situation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to be fair, I mean, I really appreciate you. For a start, you contact us. We were apprehensive. It's, it's, it's scary. It's scary opening up feelings. It's scary leaving yourself vulnerable. It's scary looking at what, you're, what you could not or could have done. I mean, we've got a number of years that I think people don't understand which, which we're trying to get across is the fact that it, it's like eating a lump of steak. You can swallow it down, but eventually you'll get indigestion from it. It rises, you know, oh, I, I've really enjoyed this chilli-filled meal, but I'm going to get indigestion from it. And the same applies. I can shove it down. I can, I can keep myself really busy. I can work and I can try and uh, distract myself away from it, but there's no way around it. Sadly for us, uh, even people who are close to us don't get it. They don't get the fact that today... 
is going to be the same as tomorrow for a period of time. I'm not saying, look, we're not the worst in the world. You walk down a street and you see someone and they're worse off than us. And I'm not playing that I'm, I'm wearing a victim's backpack or something. Our situation is, is not the worst of the world. But for us it is. For us it is. What makes it difficult is the fact that you feel it but you can't explain it. People can't understand it. They're, in some cases, they're dismissive of it and they don't see the fact that this is real. This is our life. This is, it sucks. It's awful. You function, you do function. I mean, goodness me, well, I'm not curled up in the, in the fetal position in the corner of a room. But there are times it's, it's kind of like, to, to be perfectly honest, doing this podcast, I don't think, well, as I said, said to Lauren, I haven't cried since I was nine years old because I've been trying not to. But you get to a point where, like, there needs to be a sense of compassion, a sense of understanding of what family members go through because it's weird. It's actually not, I cut my finger, I put a Band-Aid on it. It repairs itself. This doesn't. This doesn't repair with a Band-Aid. That's exactly right. This is unique yep. torment. Of course, things can always be worse and we do naturally, when bad things happen, want to compare. Um, there is comfort in, I guess, in a weird way going, oh, yeah, you know, at least you know, at least we have a roof over our heads. Of, you know, at least we've got food. But it is a very unique type of torment and people don't understand it. And it is important for people like you in your position to have an opportunity to share your perspective, to know that, you know, I'm not interested in the details of Paul's disappearance and those vital stats and the facts around it. No, I'm, I think what people really need to understand is the way that it has impacted your lives, your, your marriage, the financial ramifications of this, the social Impact. I mean, you you mentioned earlier that at parties you've had some weird situations. Well, basically, you go to a party, and, and like we all do, we all, you know, you make small talk. You go to a party and say, "Oh, good day. How are you? My name's Nick. This is my wife Jenny. Oh, yeah. And how many kids have you got?" And you almost have to stumble. Yes, we've got two. Oh, what are they doing? You're thinking. Well, now you have to lie to them, and. By the same token, you're at a party. You don't want to suddenly say, well, you know, by the way, we've got a missing son and blah. And you think, everyone think, God, that's a bit of a downer, you know. And um, you really find yourself, oftentimes you'll say you've only got one son, which is, again, is almost like lying to yourself. Most cases, I mean, if I'm totally honest, most missing persons' family members are unaware totally unaware. If you were aware, maybe you could do something differently. But we do stuff because we're not aware. We have no sense of why a person would go missing. So in that sense, it's hard socially. Look, there's a lot of things, even on an administrative point of view, a, a missing person that I think people forget, a missing person still has things. Like, for example, with Paul, he had a bank account. He had a superannuation policy. He had shareholdings. He had a number of items. Now, they don't just stop because he's missing. In order for me to continue managing his, his affairs, I had to get a guardianship order, which meant I had to go before VCAT and then say, look, I'm making these declare on the basis that my son is a missing person. Until such time as he comes back, I wish to manage his affairs. And they give you a guardianship order for that year and then you come back and you renew it or basically re reapply for it. I would go every year to re reaffirm my guardianship order I'd, and I would go in and I'd take a day off work, go in and have my guardianship order upgraded. I would go before an administrator, they would look at it and say, yes, there has been no change of your guardianship and I'd say, no, there was no difference, no, we will re issue your guardianship. Now, that went on for about five years, and this is just a bit anecdotally. Probably for about five years, I went back and forth each year, came to this time, put forward my application this fifth year, and the officer said, um, 
you can't extend this order uh, until you make a determination. I said, well, I'm not really sure what you mean. What sort of determination do you want me to make? And she said, well, you've got to make a determination about his status. And I said, well, he's missing. His status is missing. Oh, no, you've got to determine the fact that his status is now deceased. I said, well, I'm not prepared to do that because for all intents and purposes for my life, be it five years, be it 10 years, be it 15 years, Paul's not dead until Paul's dead. And I don't see that I will be making a declaration in the foreseeable future until such time as I get evidence. Anyway, and I actually did say to this person, have you any idea how hard this is? I've got to come in every year and to get a guardianship order to run the affairs. My son who's missing, yes, potentially he may be dead. He may be dead. But that's not today. That's not now. And you're asking me to say declaring him dead. She said, uh, if you don't make a declaration of such, I will rescind your guardianship order. And I said, well, at that stage, I think I was pretty dirty on it. And I said, well, knock yourself out, do your worst. And the sad part is, all right, I was a bit truculent, probably a bit angry. Within two weeks, I got a notification my guardianship order had been rescinded, had been revoked. Now, okay, maybe in the administrative world that they live in, we must have a time frame. I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe... Um, there is a, um, a statute of limitations of how long you've got to be missing before you're declared dead. To be fair, the officers up to that stage were showed great compassion and empathy. So I, I, I have no real complaint regarding VCAT as, as an item, but this one officer was very, very discompassionate. For those who are, are missing and look for people who are listening to this, Sometimes stuff is really, really hard and it's stuff you don't control. That needs to be changed. So many policies need to be changed to fit with this. I mean, it is a grey area, it is complex, but it's 2020. Like, there's yeah. got to be improvements made. Uh, we're working on it. Uh, it's going to take a while, but we'll get there. So what does that mean now in terms of the guardianship? I took out the guardianship order probably, as I say, a lot of years ago. I contacted all the um, people who he deals with, banks, shareholdings and stuff like that. Now, I kept a, a communication running through all the time, with, which basically they became uh, very comfortable the fact that I was doing it. So I didn't actually need to reaffirm my guardianship order because they knew who I was, which is for somebody who, in a similar situation, you've got to make yourself well known that you are the guardian. Otherwise, for a lot of things, simple things that people don't realise, if somebody doesn't activate their superannuation, it becomes eaten away on fees and also the government can garnish it or, garnish it or whatever they do. Um, in that sense, so keep that, that line because your person's not gone. They're not dead. Just keep it working. There's so much additional work for you guys. Yeah. But look... It is a bit of work, but it's no, you do it. Uh, to be honest, I got to a point where it's the least I can do. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's almost like a buy-off. I'll, I'll do whatever I can whenever I can. So, yeah, no, it's a buy-off. I think most parents would find that, no, nah, it's a small price to pay. I'll do it. It's okay. Absolutely. You said that Paul, you know, was just a young guy who maybe did a few things wrong, yeah. which I think everyone can relate to. He was young. You know, people young. do make yep. mistakes. Yep. And that doesn't make you a bad person. And in fact, you've painted him in a very clear picture that he was he was kind, he was strong, he was loyal, he was very loving. Do you feel that the response from the police in the beginning, because he there was a warrant out for his arrest, yep. this might sound like an odd question, but it's something that we considered when Dan went missing. Because police wanted him, did you feel that they were going to try harder to search for him? Because we actually thought, oh, if only Dan had robbed a bank the day before, then they would actively search for him. So that's what that's you guys believe. Absolutely. Believed. He's not a bad person. So, But when early days, because he had a warrant regarding a missing a, uh, a hearing, I got the feeling at those early days, maybe it's changed now, this was going to be a cheap collar. If we can get Paul Beauty, this would be an easy, easy arrest. And... 
if we can voice the communication and the actual conversation with his parents that they are harbouring him, it's an easy one. Sadly, that was sort of our impression. Maybe that was rightly or wrongly. I'm going to say rightly or wrongly. We might have misinterpreted it, but that's how we saw it. And I think if somebody has got a, an element of criminal activity, that's, that's the feeling they'll get. Uh, one of the actual officers was very, I mean, I remember him saying, are you harbouring him? I said, we reported him missing. And he goes, sometimes you do. I said, are you an idiot? And, uh, and I said, we reported him missing. I mean, sorry, have I missed something here? You know, we reported him missing. And I'm thinking, this is bizarre. So initially, you said that um, you didn't want to feel silly for creating a fuss. Yeah. And I think that's something that many families um, worry about, yeah. especially with adult men, yeah. um, where there is this illusion that they are able to take care of themselves and that, you know, you don't want to create this big drama. But did you worry, how soon was it that you went to the media and how did you navigate? I'm actually not sure the the process, but we had... We, when we reported him missing, I think he went on to the missing persons register. But that was pretty good. They had photographs of him. I believe with this current cold case, they are going to age enhance him. So they're going to make him look like the age that he would be currently. In that sense, at the time when Paul was missing, they had fairly recent photographs. And they had all the details of him. You know, he was tattooed, he had a tattoo on his back and this sort of thing. So that was pretty good then. But it seemed to be subsequently less than keen. They were, they were fairly unmotivated. Okay, so you didn't have any sensationalistic journalists and media coming to you and trying honestly, to... Honestly, was we're ordinary. We're actually ordinary. Jenny and I and Paul, for the large part, are ordinary. We don't rank, and that's possibly, and I don't mean to be nasty, that's possibly where missing persons get on the back on the back burner because we are ordinary. We're just average people. We're not sensational people. And I think that's a reason that's an unfortunate part of um, missing persons because we're just, we're pretty dull, really, I guess. Our lives, uh, for all intents and purposes, is pretty dull. Well, no, that's good. It can yeah. be very hurtful when, you know, I'm sure... The majority of families do have interactions with media in particular that aren't ideal and no. can be quite hurtful to have their loved one painted in a light that is sensationalised and does therefore bring forward all sorts of judgments. And again, you know, based on the, the criminal element to Paul's situation, there could have been people coming to you with all sorts of... I, I think if he'd done, I suppose, not... And they're, pretty, they're sort of petty crimes. Exactly. They're petty crimes. So, exactly. Yeah. But people are weird about I mean, the whole topic is shrouded in stigma and taboo regardless of the circumstances. Absolutely. Like people don't want to talk about missing persons. It's awkward. It's confronting. Yeah. We're not comfortable with uncertainty in general as human beings. So people um, don't know how to broach the issue. But even if some people, you know, they read something about this, this story of yours and they don't think that Paul is deserving of their sympathy, they can see that the parents and the, yeah. the fr you know, yeah. his yeah. family is deserving of empathy. It's the time not, now. Yeah. We're not, well, we probably will always feel that we are to blame. Jenny and I will always feel that as part of our life. But we don't believe we've actually done anything to deserve any disdain or anger or angst regarding, you know, Paul. It's come to a point too, I think probably it's taken only in the last 12 months, where we've been brave enough, bold enough to say, yes, our son is a missing person. And that comes to another point with people who are doing fundraising or they're doing special events, things such as, now I give an example, Are You OK Day, which is sort of fairly closely related to Missing Persons Day. And a lot of people come fluffing around at a workplace, are you OK, are you OK? It's got to be something that's fair income. Don't do it like window dressing because sometimes people aren't. And sadly for the two women who came out of my workplace and said, are you okay? I actually said, no, I'm not, now that you mention it. And I actually, for probably the first time, said, no, we're going through a certain situation. Our son's missing. Where do I go from here? Now, all I could hear was a scuttling of feet as they were trying to get out the door. Now, that's not 
if it's something that's going to be done in a workplace, it's got to be done properly because sometimes stupid or doing it wrongly hurts, is more hurtful than doing nothing. It's actually more hurtful than doing nothing because you think, why are you doing this? Because they, you don't care. Oh, it's just because people haven't had a chance to learn about it. They haven't heard about it. There's never been a, a platform like this where families and friends left behind can speak about what the experience is like and therefore there's no language around it, there's no education around it. So people are really taken aback when you, you mention right. the fact that yeah. you've got a loved one missing. So I can I can understand why that is, but it's it just goes to show how much work needs to be done so that people can respond appropriately to families in your predicament. Have you had other inappropriate or insensitive comments from people? What about even from friends? Like when this yes. first happened? That's a very interesting question. I don't know if we ever did. I know we've had people say, oh, it's been such a long time, get over it. Uh, why are you still going on about this? And aren't you over it yet? And you're thinking, well, no, no, I'm not. Jenny and I have probably masked it a lot. I've tried to hide it. We've probably, as I say, tried to swallow it down a lot. It's probably really only in the last couple of years, really, we've actually, dare I say, fessed up and said, this is what our life's about. This is what we deal with on occasion. We don't we don't labour and we don't, don't want to, you know, terrorise people without, with, but it exists. And I suppose even for Jenny and I to talk to each other and expose our vulnerabilities, our, our hurt, and I can't expect people to understand that. I can't expect people to know. I wouldn't want them to, be, to be honest, but I can't expect it. And that just adds to the feeling, I think, of isolation Absolutely. when this happens yeah. because no one really gets it. Have you reached out to other families of missing people? No. In- we, uh, look, we, we were on the Facebook thing for missing persons, so we get comments there which are always positive, which are always really, especially around missing person. Week. It's a tough gig. But people don't realise missing person week, for all it highlights the loss, it also is hard because there's about three or four elements. There's Paul's birthday, Christmas, New Year and Missing Persons Week. And they're they're tough gigs. They're really hard to get over. And you find yourself trying to be busy and trying not to internalise it too much. But no, we haven't reached out to others in answer to your question, not much at all. Do you think it would help? I think some sort of counselling would probably help Jenny and I in in a lot of ways. We've never considered it because you, you seem to think you're okay. Oh, well, psychologists all around the world consider ambiguous loss to be the most stressful and traumatic type of grief that there is. So it is really important that we make sure counsellors are equipped with the tools to support families who are living with it because it is so unique and complex. Hope is a difficult thing. It's always there, but does it change over time? For Jenny and I... We are, we are not delusional. We're not hard-faced or anything like that or uncaring, but we're not stupid. So in a lot of cases we feel Paul's life is, uh, has been a, an ac- active one. For him not to come into some sort of notice would be, would be unusual over a period of time. Uh, sometimes we really feel euphoric that that maybe he's alive or almost like you get a feeling, I believe he's alive. And other times you get almost a sense of dread, of emptiness that he's not. And um, there's no rhyme nor rhythm. It's not as if there's anything that would would actually precipitate that. It's not as if, oh, the, the day is such and such. I mean, things remind you, but one of the things we have all his goods, all his things that he had, and we... We had them in the garage, but they were visible. So now we have them in a storage area at the home, but they're not visible. That was hard because whilst you don't want to, you'd never forget the person, you don't want that constant um, needling reminder because that just takes away everything from you and it's just hard. That's just hard. And you can't get rid of it. No. He's got stuff there that is just, I mean, it's rubbish, but... I will never, I could never, never get rid of it. And I, but I don't want to see it every day. I know it's there and I've actually stacked it and 
made sure it's all right. For my own self-preservation a bit, I've got to maybe hide it and mask it slightly. And certainly Jenny does too. I think that's very wise. I think you come up with little strategies that sort of help and sometimes for Jenny and I it's keeping busy, trying to distract ourselves, but it doesn't always work. About that, I um, everyone's different. Every situation is obviously going to vary. How long was it before you went back to work, both of you, after Paul disappeared? I honestly can't remember. It would not have been a long time because when he went missing, we assumed he was just gone away and we just assumed he was gone. So I think probably we'd gone on holiday, we'd come back from holiday, I would assume it'd be probably maybe a week or so. I think we gave the time to try and find him, but I think we just assumed foolish oh no no it's just Paul a couple of times he's not gone missing he's been away without notification I mean he's a grown man they they do that did you wonder originally that perhaps he was just not coming back because he was concerned about the the warrant I believe so yeah you look I that was my thought yeah very much so and then the other aspects of you know his house and a bit of marijuana and stuff like that I thought we thought oh you know because we have no knowledge of it. We thought, oh, maybe it's something bad, you know, like something, somebody bad in that criminal element. But there was no no evidence of that. There was no evidence of, of any foul play or anything like that. It was, you know, just he'd just gone. As I say, with his dog there, which turned out to be, to be honest, it turned out to be the best dog we've ever had. It was a beautiful animal. We had it for a long time. Funnily enough, having his dog was really good because I always felt we're just looking after your dog until you come back. Now, sadly, she passed away, but that was good because that was a part of him. It must have been really tough when she passed away. It was. She got, uh, sadly, Rottweilers get cancer apparently and um, she got cancer in the leg. It's quite common. And, um, you know, there's 40 kilos of it and we had to put her to sleep and that was devastating. That was just... That was just, ah. Oh. Because Paul loved her. Absolutely. And yep. it's when those things happen, when yep. when people and pets pass away and oh. they're just more things that they're missing out on. It's love by extension, you're right. I mean, that was his dog and that was, yeah, yeah we loved her by extension because that was Paul's, yeah. Yeah, very hard. But we were fortunate in that sense to look after her and have that, you know, I suppose that tie with her, yeah, which is good. What other things has Paul missed that really stand out to you? Um, oh, a lot of things, a lot of things. Hayden is the martial arts black belt and, and so am I. And uh, so he missed Hayden's getting his black belt. He missed me getting my black belt. Hayden has done MMA fighting. He's missed Hayden doing MMA fighting. He's missed Hayden becoming an electrician. He's missed Hayden becoming now doing a carpentry apprenticeship and becoming a carpenter. He'd missed a lot of stuff, good stuff, and stuff he would have been hellish proud of. Do you see parts of him in Hayden and is that...? Yes, some. Determination. Same determination. Different souls, but to be fair, I guess, and Jenny and I would be always, would always stand by this, we're different people. We took great ownership and what we did wrong, we believed by perception and we vowed not to do, like simple things, Paul struggled at school. We took the school teacher's word as being gospel. Now, that wasn't the case. That didn't, not one size fits all. Now, Paul needed difference. He needed, he went to a community school that, that focused on the fact of Paul, not the curriculum. In that sense, we were probably a lot more, I suppose, open when Hayden went to school. You know, we had, we had different options. I mean, obviously our, our situation was different too, but um, we did different things. Uh, so he's a different soul, but he's, he's in some ways he could be very similar too. And how has he coped, do you think, with...? He misses him. There's no other way of looking at it. He misses him. Um, for things like that. No, when he first fought, when he first fought, um, and believe me, as a parent for, for a son who fights, that is the hardest thing in the world, he said, Paul, I would have liked Paul to be here. That's hard. That is hard. Mm-hmm. But a charmer, a charmer. And, you know, 
Jenny's parents are old. They're like, they're, they're still on, both alive, 96 and 91, and they love Paul. So they won't be there. They won't be there. I mean, Jenny and I won't be there. And we sort of, I suppose, would like just, I don't know, maybe one last time. No one is ever prepared for this no. situation to unfold. And hindsight is always well, it's really, It's a beauty, isn't it? Mm-hmm. We don't have it. Sure is. Mm. Is passing away before you guys know your greatest fear? If I'm totally honest, I feel it's an inevitability. I do believe I will die before he's found or I don't believe we'll hear what happens. I don't, in my own heart, I don't believe we will. I'm hopeful. I'm ever so hopeful. But I, I, in my, if I'm totally honest, I don't believe, I'll, you know, I don't believe the time frame's there. You know, I think such a long time has gone by. I would like to think so. But I think poor old Jenny and I will go to our graves not knowing. What's it going to take for Paul to be found? I honestly don't know. We've put out things of, we're not tech savvy, but I know full well that most people of that age and that era are. We put out stuff to say, you know, just all he would need to do. I mean, I wouldn't care if he did it from a, a library or something or other, if he did, wanted to maintain his identity, I'm okay. Whether that'll happen, whether it's through missing persons, whether it's through the, the Facebook thing we've got, I don't know. But that, I could die a happy man. Have you guys stayed in the same house, just in case? We did for a while. We did for a long while. We were in Melbourne for a long time. I think that also was really difficult because we didn't want to we didn't want to let it go because just in case he came back. But it came to a point where we had to. I guess we had to. And we're infinitely fi- infinitely findable. So we weren't fearing that we were actually cutting ties. We were always allowing ourselves to be, well, if he needed to find us, we were there. It's beautiful, the connection that you still have with him. And it's always oh, there. There were times, and, and I suppose, as you say, and, and other parents would be able to say the same thing, you see things from your own point of view, which has turned out to be imp- implicitly wrong, where you discipline to a certain level, you think, oh, that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. It's not. You know, we, we did have conflict as parent, uh, parent and son, but we were finding common ground as he got older. You know, he, you know, there were times in his life where he did some amazing, I mean, always did amazing things. He did some amazing things as a young man. And... Um, I was hellish proud of him, you know. Maybe, though, maybe, though, in hindsight, maybe I never told him enough, though, which is always a parent's folly. Maybe I never said, I'm so proud of you. And I could have, or maybe I should have. So, but I don't know. You don't know. You don't, and there's, I think guilt is a very oh. natural and normal element yeah. to, to this whole experience for everyone involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was I right? No, probably not. But maybe I could have been a little bit more circumspect. Sometimes you've got to learn to listen and maybe I didn't listen enough. Certainly not when he was sort of 15, 16 years old. So it did did change the way that you guys parented with Hayden. Absolutely. In more ways than just the schooling and... I learnt to ask. I learnt to not give my opinion because I'm opinionated. I'm, I'll be the first to admit it, you know. Sometimes I should tell myself, just shut up, Nick. Stop talking. So I learnt to ask, that's a good idea, hey? Um, I probably wouldn't look at it like that, but that's a good idea. What would you do, Dad? Oh, well, I'd probably look at it from this point of view. Allow him to. And, and instead of maybe uh, uh, making an opinion or making a judgment or telling the way I think it is, which doesn't make us right. It's, it's not implicit. Maybe I've learnt to allow a little bit more, a bit more flexibility, probably a little bit more leniency. Hopefully that works out for him. I mean, Hayden at the moment is 27. He's doing his own thing very much and, you know, I have a good relationship with him um, and hopefully that may, stays and maintains. What other ways do you think it's impacted 
you directly. So, I mean, this is what people don't usually realise is that one person goes missing. A lot of people are profoundly and directly affected by that. I've been able to control myself or my emotions to a large degree, either by shutting, not shutting off, but I suppose trying to mask them, which is probably not a positive thing to do. I've found control. In fact, I'd go to gym a lot. I do still do martial arts. You know, that makes me a better person. I know that for a fact because I control myself. Not that I, I would ever lose control. It's just, I suppose, allowing myself to, and from, and from my stupid perspective, not to get emotional. And I've been, as I say, it's the first time, gosh, nearly uh, 50-something years, I've cried. It's torment, Ooh. absolute yeah. torment yeah. Yeah. in every way conceivable. Yeah. What it has actually made me realise, though, is I work in an educational area at a TAFE college. I suppose I've got a certain amount of cynicism about teaching in the fact that I tend to very much now look at a person as the person. I have a sort of a healthy disrespect or disregard for a curriculum over there. But I find people, young folk who are spirited, energetic, dare say they've come from school where they've been disruptive, bad, bad influences. I find them interesting and I can see great value of them. They rise to the occasion because they are. They're not ordinary. They're not bland. They're very interesting. And maybe that's because Paul is that. And maybe because I believe Hayden is that. So it's made me, I think, not to judge, not to see. I'm not right. I mean, I'm a lot of times not right, you know. My surname might be that. (laughs) <laughs> but really, it could be rarely, you know, it could be rarely in a little case. And I've got to believe that it's rarely right rather than always. When a tragedy like this happens, I think it does give you, uh, it kind of forces you to look inward yeah. and reflect on the way that you think about things, view people, respond to certain ways. Yeah. Um, it is really interesting to to hear about how drastically people can change their views on things when they go through something like this. I think you don't realise the extent of it. And look, I'm intimately aware how, how devastating this has been for Jenny. And I think, rightly or wrongly, um, I believe my role must be to be the rock, hold it together. Doesn't always work. It's hard. It's hard. I can't even imagine. How has this affected your marriage? I can only... I would say it's the worst thing to happen to a couple. But having said that, Jenny and I, I think, probably even love each other more than when when we were married or when we first met. So, look, she's my best friend. So it's pretty good. It's wonderful to have someone alongside you through this nightmare. I think it is one of those things that can make or break. Oh, very much. Look, I would suspect so. I mean, I don't know other people who've gone through. I've known other people who've lost children through car accident and stuff like that. More, but I know them more by extension. I don't know them terribly well. You know, it's like a workplace thing. And... It has been like a wedge in their life and it's, and it's driven them. And, look, I can understand that 100% because the whole focus of their life is gone. I suppose in that sense we could, we could have seen the same way. I don't know, but we don't. We don't because, I mean, we could see the fact that, yep, there might have been a logical argument not to go to Nambour, probably a very good logical argument. We weren't going to take it. So... Um, We're prepared to do, I suppose, together and discuss it together, you know, have a boardroom meeting as we're going for a walk along, you know, taking the dogs for a walk and discuss the best way of doing it. Whether we get it right this time, I don't know. I don't know. We'll give it a best shot though. 
You're doing a tremendous job. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'll from what last, I've seen. The last, I'll be the last to take that, any accolade like that. So, no, yeah, we, we, we'll hang in there. We'll try. We'll try. You mentioned earlier about the complexities around your wills. Yes. In regards to Paul. Well, well, when it comes down to it, we've got, we've got circumstances like obviously we have two sons, but we don't have two sons at the moment. So when we die... There is going to be circumstance that'll be, it goes to, are there any, you know, heirs? And it's, yes, it's quite complex. Well, at the moment we're trying to actually manipulate that. So even even the legal, we went to a solicitor and say, well, look, we want to draft this. He goes, this is very complex. And it, it, it is. I mean, understandably for everyone who's, um, if we look at everyone at the moment, if we look at circumstances with people's family. To be fair, most people are a bit complex. We've kept it exactly the same as if Paul was there uh, until such time. I guess we will have to make some sort of determination, I guess, regarding Paul before we die. Hopefully we're not doing that in a, a bit sooner. It's a bit more later than sooner, I'm hoping. I hope, you, you know, you know, be sort of around for a few more years yet. So we'll try and we'll hang in there there. But, yeah, it will, it will be different. It will be difficult. It will be difficult. So there's a lot of impact. Cross that bridge when you come yeah, to it. Yeah. We're just anticipating all of these things that you shouldn't yeah. have to be thinking about. Uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes getting stuff in order works for me, like getting having a list of stuff I have to do. If I get that done, I feel a sense of achievement. Oh, well, okay, I've got over that. I've done that. That's good. I can tick that one off. And I think that's sometimes uh, helpful rather than, um, than being a hindrance. So, look, uh, you know, do I, I keep everything in order like that? Yeah, we've got that. That's in place. And I contact his superannuation board, say, yeah, look, I've got the recent, that stuff keeps it ticking over. Yeah, I'm the same. I like to take a very pragmatic approach to these things. So having a checklist and knowing that I've, you know, done yeah. certain yeah. things that I can do because typically people in this situation are powerless and you feel like you that there is no hope, there is no help available. It's all very, you know, complicated and no one really knows how to broach it. So um, when there are things that you can do to line up the ducks that you yeah. can line up in a row, it, I guess, does give you a sense of... Achievement, if you like, yeah, yeah. I mean, and also to, I'm a great list writer because I'm too stupid to remember things. <laughs> I mean, if I've got 14 things to remember, I'll remember about four but I'll remember one list. So in that sense, if I get myself organised with stuff I have to do, be it with Paul or Hayden or whoever, I'm better off. Stress does have a profound impact on the human brain and this is prolonged stress. This is, you know, 17 years of not knowing and that's an extraordinary amount of yeah. stress to be living with day to day. So families often will, you know, experience anxiety and depression and even memory loss, like this does affect people Absolutely. in a lot of yep. different ways. Yep. Have you noticed that within yourself? Uh, look, I not so much because I actually, to be honest, I have to, I have to remember stuff because I've, I do teaching of, um, and I do it a little bit online and stuff like that. I have to remember a lot of people. So I find if I make myself remember that my greatest fear, my one of my greatest fears is the loss of my mind. Maybe it's sublime ignorance, I don't know. Maybe I have no, have no problems, but I fear the fact of losing my mind, so I try and make myself think I'll remember stuff. It goes with the old, the old comment, if I can remember the word Alzheimer's, I haven't got it. So hopefully I'm so far so good, but, you know, I think sometimes also pigeonholing your grief is an unfortunate thing that I do or in my, you know, my sadness in order to make it get through it. And not a, probably not a good thing but something I've done for years. Many do, yeah. especially from your generation. Yes. Um, is It is very bad. Do you worry that you're going to forget memories of Paul? Do you write them down? Is that This has actually been very good because when we came to get, do this and... In all honesty, I would suggest most people do something, not something like this, but like 
puts document stuff because it is really easy to forget time. And, and you know, like there's a lot of things like your t- the time, time frames of where somebody does an activity and you think, oh, yeah, that was two years ago. Well, no, it's actually six years ago or I'll turn it the other way around. Mm. I'm glad to hear that because it is an interesting position to be in where you're stuck for a period of time. You don't know when it's going to end. You're just stuck in this limbo and there are certain things that you can't do because this is not a standard loss. It's not traditional bereavement and the things that go along with that where you can organise a funeral and you get yeah. and you get the grave and you get those memories together and you might write them down and there's a, there's a ceremony around it but families like ours, you, know, yeah. you don't get that. No. So it is important to have an outlet and also to show them beyond those, you know, height, date of birth, where they were last seen, that they are reduced to in posters. Exactly. They're, they're down to being data. And for all people who've, not all well, people, I suppose, who suffer, I'm not saying, as I say, I'm not saying that we're, we're, we're the worst in the world and, uh, you know, we're woe is us and everything, but anything that happens to people, I mean, people could die from the coronavirus. They're still, they're people. They're not just number 826 death. You know, they're a person. And the same as a missing, you know, like a missing person, a dead person. They're a person. And unfortunately, the media and probably our perceptions put them down as a number. And they're not. He's not, he's not six foot two. He's not this. He's not this blue eye. He's actually Paul. And it's a real person. And Hopefully it will be a real person to come back. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't, for whatever reason, if he doesn't come back and he is found and he's deceased or whatever, he's our son. He's ours and not a number, not a stat. We're going to find that routinely now, we're going to find a lot of people are going to get family breakup, really, really bad stress, really bad things with the coronavirus. We're going to find people's family members are going to die. It's going to be devastating. They're not just numbers. Oh, heavens above, we've got 126 dead. 126 people that each one of those family members is going to have to deal with because they haven't orchestrated their death. They haven't manufactured how that's happened. This is something that they had no control over. Same. You don't control it. Have you noticed this has made you a more compassionate man? I just hearing you uh, say no, that. No, I'm, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And I don't mean that I'm not compassionate. I mean that I'm a little bit impatient with, I feel, I, I, I see people who've got real stress and drama and I'm slightly intolerant of people who are just, uh, let's say, put them on television and they're a bit vacuous, you know. I don't mean to say, you know, get over it and all, because that's not fair to say because I didn't like it said by me. But I look at the fact of, oh, no, you've broken a nail. And actually somebody's probably done a little bit more than that and I find myself maybe having to walk away from that because I see, as I say, there's going to be people who are going to have real death, uh, you know, real sadness, real loss. And we've got people who are going, oh, my goodness me, I'm out of toilet paper. I'm um, sorry, there's a bit more to it. And so I get maybe a little less than compassionate regarding people like that rather than seeing the bigger picture. I'm actually seeing the bigger picture a bit more these days. Yeah. Well, it gives you a perspective on things in life when something tragic happens. Mm-hmm. You go, you reevaluate what you can um, get upset about. (laughs) Having said that, I do find myself having the capacity if somebody does have an issue and um, I'm happy to listen, happy to listen. I've had people who are going through this and I've got time or I make time now and I've been a bit time greedy instead of being a bit more giving, so... I think it's made me maybe try a bit harder. I'd like to think I'll be, each day I'll be a better person if I could. I'd like to think so. 
mindset to have. Well, whether, whether it'll work out, I don't know. <laughs> Time I'll will tell. I'll, I'll check in. De- I'll give it the best <laughs> shot. Well, Nick, you've done a tremendous job of sharing your son and his character with us and I can only imagine how difficult that was. So thank you no, thank so you. much for doing thank it. Thank you for allowing me to, you know, blubber and talk. To this day, Paul's vehicle has never been recovered and his bank accounts have not been touched. Paul remains listed as a missing person on the AFP's National Missing Persons Coordination Centre database. Today, he would be 44 years old. At this stage, I just want to know, are you okay? If you're overseas, fantastic. I don't want to live in your life. I don't want to... I don't want to bother you. I just want to know if you're happy. I'd like to think you've got wife and kids if that's what you want. I just want to know you're okay. That's it. Nick has often thought about what he would say to Paul if he could speak to him now. I would say to Paul, I'm sorry. Because I feel responsible. I feel guilty. I should have done better. I feel I just would like the chance to say, I'm sorry. I love you. I just want to see you again. To be honest, this is this is one of the hardest things I've had to do. I'm a person from a, a stupid generation where men don't cry or show their feelings. I've blown that. I miss him so much. In 2012, Nick and Jenny created a Facebook page about their son's disappearance in the hope that it would generate some leads. The very first post is a heartfelt open letter to Paul from his mother, Jenny. Recently, she wrote a new one. Paul, it's been a long time since I wrote to you, but now it's time to reach out to you again. It was tough in 2019. Your brother turned the same age as you when you went missing. I was scared. Dad and I are getting older, as you are, and we're looking at retiring, but this will be really hard for us because all we've known is work and through this, hiding our hurt. Hayden, as I have said before, is like you, but possibly a better driver than you. He likes his fitness and he also has a love of animals like you and he misses you very much. We laughed about you the other day, how you would tease him, but now he is a man and I think he would like to tease you and even have a gym session with you and possibly a beer or two with you afterwards. Mum and Dad are now in their 90s and have a few health issues, but they still talk about you and also miss you. Paul, you have so many new family members to meet as all your cousins have partners and children of their own and they would all love to meet you. I've been to funerals since you've left and I cry, but I think I'm selfishly crying for you. I'm embarrassed by this, but I think of you. I will always remember when you and I went to a funeral and I got upset and you gently took my hand and held it wish I could hold your hand now. On Christmas Day, we light a candle for you. And sadly, I blow it out that night, thinking maybe next year you may be here and I won't need that damn candle. Paul, I thought the pain of you gone would ease with time, but it doesn't and possibly even gets worse. Really, why would it ease? You're our son and we don't know where you are. Paul, they have a name for it now. It's called ambiguous loss. It means when people leave and you don't know where they are or what has happened to them. Our family is definitely experiencing this. You being gone 
and for so long is tough on a daily basis. And some days are worse than others. Your birthday, your brother's birthday, Mother's Day, Father's Day, all the days families celebrate together. Even decorating the Christmas tree isn't the same. And to tell you the truth, I can't do it anymore. And yes, every New Year's Eve, we stay at home, hoping the phone will ring and you'll be there. I'm not sure if this letter is making any sense, but I guess I just want you to know that we love you and that this letter really only needed three words. <laughs> Come home, mate. Love, Mum. This letter I wrote to our son. However, if anybody is listening to this and has information concerning our son, Please help us find him. Paul Wright's episode was written by Erin Munro. Missing Persons Advocacy Network is an unfunded charity run by me, Lauren O'Keefe. In 2016, we started a project that paired authors and artists with Australian families to tell their stories to humanise missing loved ones beyond the stats they're typically reduced to. Though it grew to comprise murals, songs, sculptures, documentaries and coffee cups, our modern take on the old milk carton campaigns of the 80s, it began with a book called Two Short Stories. The What's Missing podcast was inspired by that book. These stories are but some of thousands. Help us help the usually unseen, unheard, forgotten community of those left behind by heading to our website where you can donate or get involved mpan.com.au that's mpan.com.au you can find us on facebook instagram and twitter using the same handle mpanaus that's m-p-a-n-a-u-s if you have a missing loved one check out our guide at missingpersonsguide.com